I uh, went to work for NASA in Houston in 1966. Worked uh, in Houston as a public information officer. I started doing mission commentary on the first of the Apollo missions, Apollo 7. And on 11, I was assigned to the uh, shift with Gene Kranz that was going to be the landing. Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great, uh, Eagle. Well, I started at NASA in 1966 in the middle of the Gemini program. I was 26 when I arrived. I was 29 when we uh, did the lunar landing mission. I had a background in broadcasting, whereas most of the NASA public affairs staff had a background in uh, newspapers, writing press. When I got involved in mission commentary, I did both jobs. Uh, we, we had a small staff. We only had about seven or eight people who were media specialists who had to deal with a, a press corps of 3,000. Well, there certainly wasn't full agreement that television cameras should be put in space. One of the principal people to assure that that happened was Chris Kraft, the director of flight operations at uh, Houston. And uh, Kraft recognized the importance that it was going to play and how, how valuable it would be to the public. In a sense, a lot of what the public gets from a space mission is the imagery. Uh, the scientists get the scientific data, but the public gets the imagery. And Kraft, I think, intuitively recognized that, got behind having television, and I suspect it would not have happened had it not been for Kraft or someone like him. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike, it really is. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? During Apollo 11, I did the shift for the lunar landing. Then we handed off to uh, Glenn Lunny's team and uh, my colleague, Jack Riley, continued with the commentary and, uh, and covered the uh, lunar surface activities, what we called the EVA, the extravehicular activity. So I watched the uh, walk on the moon like everybody else from my television at home. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The mood in mission control as we got closer and closer to the surface of the moon was a combination of both excitement and concern because they were very low on propellant. And uh, as Charlie Duke said, after the landing was successful, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue, we're breathing again. And that was literally true. Everybody was holding his breath for the, that last uh, 60 second countdown to uh, fuel depletion. 875 feet, guys looking good, down a half. Six forward. 60 seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. When Armstrong reported, the Eagle has landed. Even though the viewing room behind us had glass walls that thick, we could hear the roar from, from those people in the viewing room as, uh, as, as they re reacted to it. And, um, uh, but the flight control team did not. They, they had too much, too much still to do. But uh, certainly the, uh, the managers, uh, the politicians, the family members who were in the, in the uh, viewing room just erupted. And I don't recall ever being able to hear anything in that room before, but we could hear it when that happened. I was told by uh, a colleague uh, after the flight that uh, he had been in a restaurant after the landing and uh, there were a couple of um, average Joes sitting there having their breakfast. And one guy said to the other one, he said, you know, I was, um, I was in the troops, among the troops that landed on Normandy, on the Normandy beach at D-Day. He said, I have never been as proud of this country as I was after the lunar landing. He kept his composure, but as he, when he walked out of the restaurant, he lost it. He said, he just broke down. And I, I think, um, I think that's, that is a, is a kind of a profound statement of uh, the impact that it had on, the, on people.